my fellow comic book collectors. It's Alan, the Comic Collector Geek. And this is actually going to be a pretty cool interview because um, I've been posting a lot of stuff on Instagram. If you ever check out my stuff on Instagram, uh, you know, you can see a lot of the cool books that I post. And recently I posted one where I showed my feet. <laughs> and I was basically sorting out my uh, collection of like pre-code horror, good girl and all this stuff. And you got to see my feet in the video. But uh, a lot of people saw that video of my feet and um, I got people contacting me. And one of the people that contacted me was Golden, uh, the, the major auction site. And they were like, oh, you seem to have some good books. Would you be interested in selling them or, you know, through us? And I was like, ah, I don't sell my books, but I'd love to interview you guys, you know, your major auction house. So they put me in touch with this gentleman, uh, which is um, Ashley Cotter Cairns. So, uh, <laughs> Cairns, um, hopefully I said his name right. He'll correct me when we get, to, when I introduce him, but he's gonna be showing, he's gonna be telling us about Golden, and he's also gonna be showing his personal collection, which will be interesting. I always like to see what people who uh, work at these big auction houses have in their own collections, because they have access to some pretty awesome stuff. So we're gonna see some pretty cool stuff. So without, Further ado, let's get into it. Hi, hi, Ashley. So I hope I didn't brutalize your name. I'm I'm always messing people's names up. So it's a okay. don't worry. It was actually very good, and okay. the the most important part was you didn't think I was a woman when you said Ashley. So we're, we're all <laughs> that's, good. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, people always mess up my name, and they they think it's French, and then they call me Poulet, <laughs> which is. <laughs> which, is, which is not what I am. Um, so yeah. That's um, funny. So yeah, so quickly, actually, I always like people's, you know, origin stories. You know, I, I always feel like, you know, we're, we're comic people, you know, you got to tell that origin story, you know, were you bit by a radioactive spider? Or how did you get the collecting bug? Like, how did you get into comics? And how did you get into like working at Golden? Oh, that's such a so many questions. So it, it's <laughs> fact there is there is almost a spider's bite story. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom actually contacted me to say, "I'm moving house. I need you to come and take the junk out of the attic that you've left there for decades." Mm -hmm. And so I had no idea what she was talking about. So I went over there to go up in the attic because in in the UK and not many people know this, but uh, we don't really have basements. Uh, so any junk you have gets put into boxes and thrown up in the attic and the insulation, the insulation for the house is usually between the, the pointed roof and the ceiling of the, the first bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's no actual insulation in the bit that you store stuff. Okay. So comic books that are stored in the UK are usually, uh, the never white pages that almost always never white pages because no one has an insulated attic. It's always subject to fluctuation oh so you get that that temperature change and oh that's awesome. yeah and the worst case is the books are completely fried out but uh, the, mm -hmm. the reason i mentioned this is because to get the stuff i had to climb up in the attic mm -hmm. and as i was climbing into the attic i said to my mum, isn't there a light up here because i can't see a thing and she said no no the light bulb broke so I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay no. so as i'm climbing into the attic i put my hands out to pull my weight up because it's one of those mm -hmm like cutouts you need to climb yeah the yeah I, I... and i thought I'd, I'd stuck my hand onto a nail because it felt a horrible pain in my in my palm of my hand and it turns mm -hmm. out that the light bulb was right next to the to the hatch oh, man. Like and when it broke bulb? she just left it <laughs> and my hand went straight onto the open open element and i electrocuted myself Oh, nice. <laughs> and it, it, I don't know if you've ever been electrocuted. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's such a strange feeling. It, you feel something pass through, through, obviously, I guess that's, that's what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Electricity is passing through your body. But, but it really was painful. At the point of impact, it was very painful. So I mm -hmm. looked at my hand expecting to see blood. And in fact, there were two like burn marks from the two holes of, uh, the the, from the socket. Yeah. Wow. And it was so weird and my arm felt like i'd hit my funny bone for a few hours it was just a very strange feeling you see how how awful it must be to get a really bad electric shock in, yeah, in, in the real world yeah uh so coming down from the attic after my near-death experience i had all this stuff and I, I took it home and this was about uh the year 2000 
Okay. Uh, eBay, eBay had just launched in the UK, and a friend of mine said you should try listing this stuff on eBay. I had a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons stuff. I had some comic okay. books, but they were to totally destroyed. I had slot cars and toys and all kinds of stuff. And so I started listing them on eBay and getting incredible prices. In oh, wow. fact, so incredible, though, I was thinking, wow, I'm going to buy more of this. So I ended up, <laughs> I sold everything I owned uh, previously and then advertising to buy more. And I became a dealer of toys, basically. Oh, okay. um, fast, yeah, fast forward about uh, five years, I've moved to Canada to get married. And I was mm -hmm. importing toys from the UK, and most of my customers were still in the UK. So stuff Are you would come in, in and then I'd sell it. Are you in Canada now? Yeah, I, I live. I, I live in Montreal. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I'm yeah. So we're like I'm in Ottawa. So you're like really. Oh, like, that's funny. You really are neighbors. Yeah. No yeah, wonder yeah, you yeah. get called brulee all the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so yeah. So I realized this is ridiculous. I'm I'm having stuff shipped to my grandmother. She's mm -hmm. packing it up and shipping it to me, and then I'm sh packing it up to ship it back to people in the U. This doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. I, yeah. I need to get get specialist in something that that's actually origin in North America, and that was comic books. and And I collected mm -hmm. comics as a kid, um, and then I started buying and selling. And I I famously tell people that I I lost thirty thousand dollars in my first year of training as a comic book dealer because. I didn't know what good and bad was. I didn't know what grading was. I didn't know that shiny mm -hmm. comics, they still impressed me, even though yeah, <laughs> I should yeah, have yeah. been old enough to know better. Like, yeah, the 90s were were very shiny. <laughs> they, you know, they, dealers, yeah. dealers in Montreal love me, I think. They, they, they would... They knew that if they called me and they had this like seven boxes of shiny comics and like four bo four uh, comics and CGC holders and a bunch of crappy Silver Age, I'd be all over that. So mm. I kept buying this stuff and making losses. And then I was like, okay, I've got to do better. So then I, I contacted this guy called Sean, who was my, uh, my consignment director, an auction house that I started using. And I said, look, I need your help. I obviously don't know what I'm doing. If I'm going to be around for for more than a few months, I need someone to treat, teach me how to grade and teach me the business. And he started to teach me, okay. and gradually my consignments got better and better. And he mm -hmm. called me one day and said, "Where are all these collections coming from?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, I actually, I started a website called Sell My Comic Books, just because oh, okay. I was tired of going on Craigslist and competing competing with the same dealers for the same collections that were posted. And I thought um, there must be a better way. So I built a website." giving people free comic book pricing advice and offering free appraisals. And then people would sell me their collections and yeah, I'd break them down it. and sell them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, very no brainer. Fast forward, yeah, fast forward to 2015, Sean left his job and came to become my business partner. And we, we set up in Maine, okay. in the States. And then in 2022, Golden contacted us to say they wanted to buy a comic book dealership and we'd been recommended to them. Wow. And so they they bought us, and so we now work for Goldman. That's 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 interesting. So how is it for you? Like, what's your experience with that? Like, do you prefer being your own kind of business owner, or do you prefer your relationship with Golden? Like, which do you prefer? Uh, <laughs> there are pros and cons. I mean, I mean, there, there there are pros and cons to to every situation. I can tell you that it was a lot more stressful. In, mm -hmm. in oh, a yeah. sort of day to day yourself, it's always, yeah, yeah. way, yeah, running a business seems glamorous if you if, if you've always worked for the man, and then when you mm -hmm. start a business, you realize, oh, there's a reason that bosses seem to age faster than everybody else <laughs> yeah, is because exactly. there's all these extra problems they have to deal with, and you know, one of them being staff, and and another one being cash flow, and uh, mm -hmm. and financing, and and accounts, and you know, mm -hmm. taxes, you name it. There's there, there are all those things. So working for Golden has taken a lot of that pressure off. And all my job now is just to fill auctions with great comic books and I don't have to worry about all the other stuff that I used to have to worry about. Yeah, I mean, that must be fun in a way because you're spending other people's money or you're you're basically collecting, you know, you're, you're getting, oh, I wanna get those books and like, you know, <laughs> um, which is, which is, must be interesting. So, uh, where do you where do you find the collections? Like, like, it, do people approach you, or do you have to like you know find like kind of do a bit of like treasure hunting, or how what's the process? Well, when Golden bought us, they also bought the website, so the website still brings in collections. Okay. okay we also go out prospecting. You know, like like you received a message from us on Instagram. We go out prospecting sure. people who are showing off good books. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but the third way we, we get collections is through our Netflix series. So Golden. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're, we're the only auction house that has a Netflix series. I and mean, that was so, pretty impressive. That's a big deal, actually. You it's a that. huge deal and the it was funny thing a about the series too by the way <laughs> yeah well well the funny the funniest thing to me about the netflix series is it it was being shot just as they were acquiring us mm -hmm. and i said to the people who were negotiating with us you know do you want us to to go and look at some comic book collections are we going to get some comics in the series and they said no yeah. need to worry we, it's a bit late for that now we're, we're too tight to the, to the series deadline and we've got lots of comic book content in in the season and then when it came out, they cut the the, the producer had cut all the comic book content. There, there's there's one scene where Ken Ken Golden, the boss, is talking about a piece of of comic book art, mm -hmm. and it's actually uh, the splash page of Green Lantern Six. Okay, and that's a consignment that we brought in. One of the first things we did at Golden was bring that in. Oh, wow. uh, but the funny, the funniest part about that is that the the uh, the piece of art that we brought it in with was actually the cover to Showcase Twenty Four. They didn't oh, show wow. that in the season. I know, uh, <laughs> Gil Kane, <laughs> Gil Kane, a massive Gil Kane piece. Wow. And they didn't even feature that. And then, if you watch the entire season, at the very end, the, as as it's finishing, the credits are, are rolling. You see Spider Man's face from the Amazing Fantasy Fifteen right in the, like, in the background for half a second. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's it. I, I yeah but, I was that I was kind of that was one thing I was I, it was a good series but I I did kind of want some like comic more comic book especially I mean you guys had some pretty big books you had the Superman one that was a pretty big sale that was a pretty big do to do in the comic book community it didn't get a mention <laughs> like that's like that's a big deal I don't know I just thought that was we we have we have a lot of comic book content coming in season two season two is also okay. longer season okay. one was six episodes season two is gonna be eight episodes. And there's a lot of comic book content in season two. So that is going to bring in a ton of consignments, I'm sure. Like people I can imagine. Just go, wow, I can't wait. Well, yeah. and also you get sort of the, the boomer effect where um, a lot of the boomers are kind of either downsizing or croaking. <laughs> I, don't know, like, I don't know how to say it nicely. But um, <laughs> this is why my channel is like always controversial. Okay, so, um, <laughs> but, but seriously, you know, it, it's what's happening. Like, and you know, a lot of people don't know what to do with those collections and seeing a good series where, you know, people are talking about what do you do with a collection? You know, I think people will kind of, you know, go out and say, hey, you guys handle it. We don't have a clue what we're doing with these books, you know, um, and I think for a lot of, um, you know, people that don't know comics, it's just like the story that you had, like, you know you don't know what you don't know you just you you could you could you could sell like your you know action one for a dollar not knowing that it's actually something valuable you know if if you don't have that experience well i don't think anyone would make that mistake but my point is like a lot of the time um people don't realize what they have um actually i did hear a story of somebody basically giving away an act uh af15 thinking that it was just like oh because it's number 15 it can't be anything important <laughs> they just gave it away so I've heard stories like that. So um, uh, having a uh, like an auction house that can just basically take it and do all the work. Now, how does that work for like somebody that has a collection? Like how does like how does the process work? Like, well, yeah, we we start with asking for a list, mm -hmm. and if you haven't made a list of comic books ever, it's a daunting task. Mm -hmm. And we we typically get. Uh, both extremes so you have the extreme at one end where people just write down the names of the comic books and they don't even include the the issue numbers Great or yeah issue numbers yeah and then you get the opposite extreme where someone spends a month of their life minutely detailing everything about the comic book which year it was published who's a publisher what's written on the front cover not not just amazing spider-man but you know like uh oh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the horns of the rhino or something like they go as far as to to, to write down the the headline on the front cover you know batman secrets of the bat cave you know people actually do that mm -hmm. and then and then the cover price and and everything it's it's exhausting you don't need to do all that really yeah, yeah. Uh, i've cre i've created a system to to make a, a quick list i call it a quick list because I'm only interested in 
the range you have, right? So if you have Spider-Man, say, 17 to 250, it's much faster to write 17 to 250, and I'll ask for the pictures, and if the keys are there, then I'll see the pictures, and if they're not, they're not. But you won't have spent an hour just writing down all the names of, on a stack of comic books this big, and you've got a whole table covered with comic books, and you have to do it for 100 times. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get people to create a list as fast as they can to save as much time as possible, and I'll figure out what's what's valuable. Is there anything like uh, like um, I, I've seen technology where you can take little pictures of the books, and it will actually tell, like you know, sort of do like almost like a, a OCR kind of thing where it you know recognizes this is the title, this is the you know the all the kind of important important details about the book. I mean, you can scan the barcodes and do that as well, actually. Um, yeah, the modern modern books that have barcodes, yeah. Yeah, um, but anything, yeah, pre-78 is not going to have that. But um, so the question is, like, is there anything that you guys can offer to uh, people that are categor uh, cataloging their collections to make it easier for them? Or do you guys not have really? We don't have anything that, that's going to make it that much easier. I, I really think that... There's going to be some rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty, but okay. it's actually a good thing to sort of organize a collection and to sort of get a sense of how much work am I dealing with here? How much value is here? Like the, just having your books organized and, and stacked mm -hmm. will give you a sense of, oh yeah, this is most, this mostly, you know, my gut tells me this isn't that valuable or, or wow, you know, there's, there's all this stuff from the fifties and sixties. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll help people get through that. It's it's just there's no real shortcuts. The 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 apps you're talking about are always linked to a site where you don't really have a lot of control over the data. Once you've done that, you okay. end up with with a list that can't be uh, exported in, in a helpful format. Like you can't just get an Excel database out of there. You have to pay for that. Or it's, there's always a there's always a, a downside. Okay. Um, so people are just going to have to just follow my method. But I'd be very happy to send someone an email with a, a quick link to a video of me doing it so you can see. It's very straightforward. Once you actually got everything organized, it takes half an hour. So how about the situation um, where, you know, I've seen collections where, you know, you, you hear about these finds where it's like, you know, pre-code horror collection or something like that. Like it's like a thousand books all pre-1955 that are just amazing. Um, do you guys ever go out to those collections, like, you know, fly out or whatever it is to get to those collections or? Yeah, we absolutely will. I mean, we have to do a little bit of qualifying. Yeah, of course. I, I'm not going to get on a plane and fly over to see a 90s collection of, of, of stuff. <laughs> be a yard sale. Um, we wouldn't be in business very long if we did that. But yeah, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. once we know that there's a, a valuable collection and it's worth mm -hmm. the trip, then we will definitely come and see it. Yeah, for sure. And so, what typically, uh, like when people can sign with uh, with Golden, um, what kind of what kind of value? I, I know with Heritage, uh, they they want a minimum of ten thousand in value, that the collection has to be at least that much before they'll even kind of take interest in it. Is there is there a minimum, or is it just pretty much anything goes? What what? How does it work? We prefer items to have an individual value of two hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Uh, we will take we'll take a collection that has key issues and then lock the other stuff up. So if if you're if you're looking at say a Silver Age collection and there are 50 books in there which have an average value of $500, we'll just take the rest of them and make them into lots of 10 or 15 books, and people will be very happy to bid on those raw lots. Yeah. Uh, one 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 thing we do for people, which is really important, is that we'll pay the CGC grading fees up front. Oh, nice. And then you, you don't have to pay it until the books sell. So uh, a lot of people don't realize how expensive it is <laughs> to, I, to, I, to I grade books. It. Yeah, and, and, and that money is tied up until, you know, however long it takes CGC to they, – they charge you before they perform the service. And do you so, guys get, have any special connection with CGC where you get things processed through their system a little bit faster than the average um, job? <laughs> I, I can't say okay, okay. We'll just... on camera. Let's just say <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. though, that it's so, sometimes surprisingly quick when when uh, okay, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's we send fine. things. We, we don't know. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe. Okay, so um, yeah, so I, that's actually a really good thing because uh, one of my friends, he he got his Seven Seas collection and uh, Phantom Lady and some like early caps, uh, all 
all CG seed. And he got like this bill for like $5,000. It was like, <laughs> it was just, he was like, what? <laughs> no, it's, being being more practical about it, Alan, imagine mm -hmm. the situation where Uncle Charlie's just died and you're clearing his house because you have to sell it to meet the estate taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, quite often we get emails from people saying, I need to pay funeral expenses. I want to sell this stuff. Yeah, yeah. They don't have the money to certify these books. Yeah. And, and they need and, to be certified sometimes in order to properly sell. So well, yeah. you're gonna get more more money for most of the yeah. key issues, especially or very high grade books mm -hmm. than if they weren't certified, because most people won't pay the same kind of, of percentages. Like they'll look at a book and go, Well, what if it's restored or you know, I can't see all the damage, like what grade is it? You know, images aren't mm -hmm. always the best. You know, it's not it's not an easy thing to do to buy a book online without a, a, a certification is a risk mm -hmm. and is it ever the case that golden will actually just buy the collection to say okay here's what we you know here's what we're willing to give you and then they just buy it and then sell it for themselves or i'd never say never mm -hmm. but we're, we're primarily an auction house we are a consignment partner okay we're trying to get the most money for your collection that we can mm -hmm. and that benefits us because we get a buyer's premium of course uh, and I how, don't how is the think buyer's we premium? typically, we don't, well, I'll explain that in a second. We don't typically okay. buy collections just to finish answering a question. Once mm -hmm. in a blue moon, somebody will approach us with a, a fully certified collection. They just want immediate cash. We'll talk to you for sure. Okay. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's easy. It's almost like, you know, once it's certified, it's, it's pretty much a commodity at that point. You know, this book is worth this much based on past sales records, but, um, what is the what are the what are the fees i guess associated to somebody selling their collection through you guys well the first important thing to know is that the seller doesn't pay a fee the buyer pays a fee oh that's so if, if, if you're selling a collection that says ten thousand dollar collection uh you'll receive the ten thousand dollars of hammer prices the buyer would pay a 22 buyer's percent premium. buyer's premium right so mm -hmm. the buyer would pay twelve thousand two hundred dollars, and the difference will be our profit um, okay. after t after our costs. Obviously, the only fees you'd receive is is the CGC grading fees, mm -hmm. which would be whatever they charge us, we charge you, mm -hmm. and whatever it costs you to ship the books to us. Okay, so that's that's reasonable. I mean, that's very fair. And so basically, the 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 seller, the you know, the collect whoever has the collection gets the the hammer price. And the That's buyer's right. premium is your 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 well your profit basically on that. That's right. And and for That's... higher end collections, we will give you a piece of the of the buyer's premium. Very nice. But we're we're talking about probably twenty five thousand dollars value Plus. and up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. You know, and we will negotiate with you directly on the, on each you know, case, depending on, uh, for example, an action one is going to get a large slice of the buyer's premium. <laughs> Yeah, so that's good. I mean, that's fair in a way because those bigger books, it's like you know, that's that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars actually right. just on the buyer's premium. So, um, what? Speaking of big books, what are some of your favorite big books that have been sold through Golden? Wow, that's a great question. We've sold some incredible books. We we've sold in my first few months at the company. We sold an Action One and a Detective Twenty Seven in the same auction. And uh, I mean, those are two grails. <laughs> yeah, are the, I mean, the top five I've, books. I've always wanted, I'm a Batman guy. So I've always wanted, you can see from the painting behind me, I'm a Batman guy. So oh, I've always yeah, wanted cool. wanted to have uh, a Detective 27 and, you know, in the same way, I've always wanted to have a Playboy mansion and a yacht. Yeah, of uh, course. <laughs> so to see those oh, coming up for sale at my company uh, just shortly after joining them, I'm like, whoa, I, I've stepped up into the big leagues here, you know, like a, um, so this are you in, are you involved with um, in the promotion of that as well? Like where you know because you guys got to get the big buyers to come in. So how does that how does that work in terms of? Well, we we famously went to C two E two last year with a, a Detective Twenty Seven. Mm -hmm. um, what else was there? Superman One, Seven O, uh, a few other wow. big books. AF Fifteen, and I just sent a press release out using our press release uh, press agency. And mm -hmm. the local news uh, got in we touch like, to hey, say they wanted to interview us. Yeah, they wanted to interview yeah, yeah. us at, at the show. So actually, I wasn't actually there. I couldn't travel to that one. So Sean, my my former business partner, who also works at Golden, yeah. was on camera. 
And he said, you've got to be joking. He, he can't stand being on camera. I love doing this, but he doesn't. Yeah, and so yeah. I said, well, you know, if I could do it, I would, mate, but I can't. So you're, you're, you're the man. <laughs> Good, luck. <laughs> and so Good luck. There he was, live TV, uh, first thing in the morning. That's awesome. Was somewhere though. else. But yeah, I, that, think that, I think I actually saw that because that, that was a pretty big deal. That 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 Superman one, I I'm not sure if it's the it's the closest it's the highest graded copy of that of that Superman one. I think there's an eight oh. Yeah, there's, an it, there, there's not much at that. Like Superman one is one of those weird books that doesn't have high grades. It it really is like always beat. I don't know why it's like always a really rough. Well, book. if you're familiar with with Marvel annuals. They're, yes. they're created slightly differently to to the regular 36 page books with a staple mm -hmm. they're not stapled on the on, through the cover they're stapled on the inside and then they're glued together mm -hmm. um we call them square bounds because yes. the, the the um the spines are square they're flat mm -hmm. and for whatever reason they're really hard to find a high grade they're they're impossible to find a high grade almost. well the glue deteriorates over time there's a lot of there's a lot of issues with them um yeah, yeah. Right and Superman one was one of those books that was pulped in the war for the war effort. Then you had uh, uh, the famous guy who wrote the seduction of the innocents going around organizing book, book Burning. burnings. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's amazing that any have survived. And then you have mm -hmm. the 1980s dealers who would color touch them at, at shows. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Like, so there's not many universal copies, and Sean I and talk I actually about that a lot on my channel, the restoration and uh, and the because if you look at a lot of my books, I have some pretty big books, but a lot of them are restored. Like my my Wonder Woman, for example, is a is restored copy, but it's nice. It's a nice copy of it. You have um, one. That's that's the important thing. Yeah, that's 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 all I care about personally. And you get it cheaper when it's <laughs> restored than when it's for sure. Uh, yeah, blue yeah. Label. So um, yeah, so uh, what we were kind of, I kind of went off topic there, but I, I kind of want to talk about a bit more on some of the bigger, bigger things that you've seen at Golden. Like, okay, so we got Action One, we got Detective Twenty Seven, we got a Superman One. How about some original art? Like, so what other cool items have you seen? Yeah, we haven't been a go-to destination for original art. We sold the uh, the Showcase 24 cover I told you about. And yeah, all that's that, really the cool. The Gil Kane uh, stuff. Uh, we, we had a Hush. Uh, they did a, a trade paperback of Batman Hush. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sold the cover to that trade paperback. I think it got 60 grand, which I was really amazed. Honestly, like when a modern, modern artist, apart from the obvious ones like uh, mm -hmm. McFarlane, um, yeah. You don't expect them to sell for quite as much as that, but uh, that was that's the one that sort of springs to mind. But we we get odds and ends of art and the good mm -hmm. good stuff, but just not it's not a major. It's part not of our your catalog. focus in terms of yeah. Yeah, it's funny how some some people associate uh, certain places with places to sell art, and then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, mm -hmm. um, so we're gradually getting more of it. Okay, um, in terms of. Uh... In terms of the eras, which is your favorite era? Like golden age, silver age, modern? What what would you be? I mean, I've I've always loved golden age books, but mm -hmm. um, sort of in in I realized in in an immature way. So kind of like mm -hmm. pressing my nose against the, the window of a toy shop as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was fascinated when I first started as a comic book dealer. I was fascinated by pedigree collections, so I read about. As much yeah. as I could about pedigree collections, and the Mile High thing is just so incredible to me. Um, the story of how he discovered it, and it just it gives me chills just thinking about that. Yeah, um, yeah. But when you, when you, as an adult, if you're objective, Golden Age books aren't that good. <laughs> like if you start reading them, you're like, hmm, <laughs> the stories well, are. Right. It depends on the stories. It depends on the yeah. It depends on the books. Yeah, I think I think comic books kind of grew up in the eighties. And mm -hmm. you know, for me, that the 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 spider's bite of of superheroes was when Tim Burton did the Batman movie, and mm -hmm. you know, I grew up watching Adam West and Burton. I loved all that stuff, mm -hmm. and I had the, the little toy Corgi toys. You know, I loved it. Oh yeah, yeah, they're cool. But, but then, you know, I was nineteen years old when that that movie came out, and suddenly I was like, oh, okay, Batman can be dark and and dreary and also sexy and and really tough and like. Instead yeah, yeah. of you know camp and and, and yeah, well, and all uh, that. Silver Age really campified <laughs> Batman. You know, it, he became very campy uh, hero at that point. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, 
I do like the gritty side of Batman, but I, I felt like DC went too dark almost. You know, I felt like they, I don't know, Marvel went too like jokey and like that way. Somewhere in between is what I'd like, you know, serious, but not like, like depressing. I don't know how to say my, that. my first big collection um, was a Silver Age collection that had pretty much full runs of Marvel, but they all had cutouts. So uh, every oh, wow. second book, some of the cut pieces out of them to make, a, I guess, a scrapbook or something. And so I had to check each one to make sure they were complete. And so mm -hmm. I was also just teaching myself how to press comics. And so I would sit in the shed in 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 my garden in in winter right we were keeping warm by the, the press and mm -hmm. reading the books and i actually think that although storytelling has definitely improved since the 60s mm -hmm. i like the early marvel like the spider-man the fantastic four that's what i grew up collecting fantastic four uh mm -hmm. i like i like the stories they're still a bit basic then yeah. but you're right then they're, they're not they're not they walk that line. Uh, DC Silver Age is, is really hard to read. It's, it's you know, I remember the famous one with Batgirl on the front cover of Detective, I think it's 373, where she has a ladder and a tie, so she can't stop to to help fight the bad guys because she's yeah, too busy right, like, yeah. worrying about her legs. You know, she's yeah, like, I thought that was uh, a funny. I always love that cover, actually, just because it's a funny... It's, it's a, a cool cover. cover. Yeah. But it's hard to take that stuff seriously. And Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas I think Marvel, the whole thing, why, why Marvel was such a hit in the 60s was because they actually thought about what do the readers want to read. Yeah, well, they and... gave their characters like a full story. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of character development in, in Marvel. Yeah, that. so I like that. I still have a soft spot for the Silver Age storytelling from Marvel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and speaking of collecting and stuff, you brought some books to show uh, and you know, you can get into why these ones and, you know, uh, I'll let, I'll let you take over. I'm going to make you big and you're going to get to show your books. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope the light doesn't, doesn't sort of bother everybody, but I'm, I'll do my best. Uh, I've kind of fallen in love with two parts of collecting that I think have been underrated for a really long time. Uh, one of which I don't really have an example of here because I don't have any certified copy. I find them raw, but that is, uh, Silver Age Marvels with the UK price variants. Mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier, these are tough books because people store them in attics, and attics are a really bad place to store comics. And when you look at the CGC census numbers, the UK price variants of things like Spider-Man or uh, Daredevil, whatever, are very low. If you look at X-Men number one, I think it's 2% of the census is a UK price variant, and the highest yeah. is something like Usually a, it's a one in 50. 75. Yeah, usually yeah, it's one in yeah. 50. And, and, and the highest graded are never very nice. They're always mm -hmm. VF or my, or lower. I think there's one there's one exception that has like a 9.2 in the census, but the, the highest ASM one is 8.5, I think. Wow. Um, yeah. And and so I started collecting those. So I can't show you a picture of those because I didn't certify any of those. I've got them all raw. But I do have my other collection here, which is uh, some examples of I like collecting key issues that are foreign examples. So mm -hmm. if they're published in uh, Mexico or Italy or Spain or France or here in Quebec, um, I, I collect key issues that are not English language typically or they're reprints that, that have different covers. So... Here's an example. This is Nembo Kid, which always makes me <laughs> smile. Uh, but this is this is essentially Showcase Four um, from Italy. Okay. And it's published in 1961. And oh wow! It's, so not that much. A few like about five years later. Basically. Right. And and the, the the weird thing about foreign editions is they're typically lower grade, so you don't normally find high grade examples of them. This is not the classic Showcase 4 cover, obviously, but it's the same story, and it is a brand new cover. That's a nice thing about collecting foreign editions is they, they often produce new covers because mm -hmm. they couldn't get they couldn't get the – they got the license to produce the story, but they didn't get the license to reproduce the cover because sometimes the artists had the license for that, and they wouldn't release it. So they just got a local guy to do something different, which is what this kind of is. Uh, yeah, it makes it, it makes it actually much cooler because it is a unique cover. Exactly. Uh, this is an Italian uh, Spider-Man reprint. This is obviously an ASM3, the Doc Ock cover. I love the colors on this. It's just so so different to the original. Um, so there's that one. There's another oh, wait, one. Wait, wait, wait. I should just show that a bit more. Just, just yeah, one. sure. 
So a couple of cool things about it is like it, you know, obviously they didn't have the rights to this one because it, it is different color palette, but it looks yeah. like they mimicked it quite well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, what is it? Lugomo? Lugomo? Lugomo Ragno. Ragno. That's really interesting. Do you know what that means? <laughs> nope. But I'm guessing it probably means Spider something man. about spider <laughs> and man and and maybe there's an amazing in there as well. I, I don't know. I should I, I should know that. That's that's a good that's a good question. I didn't think of that. It's probably uh, it's probably human spider or something like that. Probably. Yeah. This is a much more famous cover. Um you can see that there. That's a, yeah. obviously a later a later book. Uh again, subtly different to the original. And I, I just, I just love the fact that you can buy these, and and they they aren't that expensive, although they are getting expensive. People are starting to realize, wow, yeah. this stuff is accessible, and so they're buying it, and people like me are buying it, and and now it's going up in price. Um, but mostly, I would I would say don't buy this sort of stuff at shows. I know mm -hmm. dealers are going to hate me for saying that, but um, <laughs> if you look on one. eBay. If you look on eBay, you'll find most of this sort of stuff that is priced double at shows, and mm -hmm. it, it's it's nice sort of eye candy stuff that will will get people putting their hands in their pockets to buy it at shows. And then you get home, you get buyer's remorse because you look up on eBay and you go, "Oh yeah, I paid twice as much for that as I should have done." But it's still mm -hmm. it's a nice stuff to collect, and it's it's cheaper sometimes than the original. Um, well, and I think with um, sort of what happened with the Mexican Spider Man. I think that really put a spotlight on these uh, foreign editions. You know Talking how. Of... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, this is not Spider-Man. Obviously, I mean, it, it says it is on the on the top, but it's yeah. it's obviously an Avengers one, and it's almost like the original, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's so weird strange. That it's, it's weird that it's Spider-Man with an Avengers cover. <laughs> yeah, I guess like anything with the name Spider-Man on it sells more than if it doesn't um yeah so this is one of my favorite books to own uh, it's it's almost like the original it's funny how i say oh i love the fact that you can pick up keys that don't look quite like the original but mm -hmm. sometimes when you see a key that looks almost exactly like the original it's like that's also cool <laughs> it's just it just i mean yeah, it's cool yeah. avengers one is cool um yeah, the yeah. nice thing is i actually have the british one as well which is um mystic this is mm -hmm. also Avengers one. Um, it's actually and, a really high grade. Like those Allen classics yeah. usually are beat <laughs> as well. Yeah, this came from the same collection. I've got another one here as well. I've got the Avengers four here. Uh, I'll show you in a second. They came from the same collection. It was all high grade, relatively speaking. Uh, and, and so I picked up a few of those. And does CBCS to know when that came out? Because with the Allen class, it's not always obvious. Yeah. There are dates on here. This one says 1965. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, some of them don't have a copyright in this year. So yeah. it, they just put no no known date, um, which is, a, is very frustrating. Mm -hmm. But I always wonder how CBC and uh, CGC and CBCS do this. Like they get these things and they must get these random books sent in. Yeah. And go, I don't know. I have no, I have no idea what this stuff is. But yeah, so that's what I collect. No, those are really cool. Oh, here's another one. I just got to take This is a Swedish book. Uh, this was actually sold in, at Golden, and I thought I have to buy this. Oh, wow. I don't know why. Isn't that cool? That's just it's just something a bit different. And yeah, so it's, it's um, Justice League, but it's but it's not. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> yeah. Who is that, knows? What... Uh, is that, is that um, Submariner on the bottom? What's that on the bottom? Some like tribal. What is that? It looks like Green Lantern and a whole bunch uh, of. It, it's it's, a, it's or... very it's very strange. Whatever it is, it's very strange. Tar mm -hmm. no, not Farzan. It says Farzan. I thought it said Tarzan, <laughs> but uh, no, it looks like well, it looks a bit like Tarzan, but it's Farzan. So they can probably do that without copyright problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, odd, very odd. But that's one it's of the nice things about collecting foreign yeah, comics. No, they're, are, they're very are, odd. Yeah, those are very interesting books. Um, like ones that you don't normally see. Yeah. Like um, I do have a few friends that collect the Alan class ones and I, I have like a, a small collection of Alan class books in my own collection. Like I have the fantastic four reprint, you know, the, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, um, that's a very popular, popular reprint. 
mm-hmm. and it's affordable compared to the original. Um, oh, I don't know how long. I don't know how long for. You know, I think I think they're starting to pick up in value because people are realizing they're actually really tough. Yeah, no, and, no. Um, and there's a lot of UK collectors that really just focus on that, and they um, they they have some pretty interesting collections actually. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so um, uh, do you ever like see auctions at Golden and you say, "Oh, I want." Yeah, or you actually try to maybe pick up a couple books from your own from your own thing. Well, firstly, I should I should uh, underline the fact that I am not allowed to bid on my own consignment. Uh, oh, that sucks. Books. Uh, well, it's it's obviously a fair thing, right? It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes conflict sense. of interest. Yeah, so yeah. if 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 you consign a bunch of books and I bid on them, that would be considered a conflict of interest, even if it of was. Course. Purely for genuine reason, which it would be. I, I'm not not a criminal. I would just want to own them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, we're we're not, we're not allowed to bid on our own consignments, which you know makes a lot of sense. You, know, yeah, you have to keep sense, things. Yeah. You have to keep a distance between yourself and and your consigners, and and you know because people could be accused of shill bidding or whatever. Well, yeah, but, yeah. You could bid it up, and then that's yeah, that's not fair. But, but for sure, yeah. there are there are books that sometimes come up in auctions, and I go. I definitely want to own that. Like this, the Gigant one, like that was, I didn't know that was going to be listed at Golden and it showed up mm-hmm. on a weekly auction and I just looked at it and went, I have never seen that before. I don't know what it's worth. I'm going to bid on it and hope I win. And I did. And it's just one of those mm-hmm. things. But yeah, I'm very careful. I'm very, very respectful of the rules because it, it's, it's the well, whole company. Sense. Yeah, it makes it's sense. the whole company and the whole industry in a sense, right? You you know that this this industry for for good you know many reasons has been tainted in the past by bad practices and yeah uh, I actually heard I, it I, did a few things too so um, everybody i'm not gonna i'm not gonna call out any names every every mm-hmm. every company pretty much not ours obviously but everybody else uh, <laughs> has has had its its share of uh controversy or or dodgy practices by the companies mm-hmm. uh people sort of you've heard obviously about the the reholdering scam at CGC and yeah. um, you know how CBCS were outsourcing to people who were off site to get stuff graded. Yeah. And books were van- well, I mean, there's I, a lot yeah, of stuff. I heard, you know, people had them in their homes and it's like, <laughs> it was just, it was really weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so controversy aside, um, like, uh, you know, um, how do you feel like golden in terms of the comic section? Like, I mean, because Golden is not comics, like solely comics. It's, it's like, I, I mean, you guys sell like big, sh- like, like the s- sneakerhead kind of stuff, the sports cards, the sports memorabilia. Uh, I saw a computer, like there was that, well, in the, in the show, they were showing this guy had a computer collection. Like it sounds lamer than it, th- but it, it was pretty cool actually. Um, so the point is you guys sell a lot of variety. How, mm. how, like, how much support does the comic section get? Like how, like how valuable do they consider like the that section of the of the company? Well, I hope they consider it valuable. I, <laughs> I can't speak for Ken, the boss, but mm-hmm. I he he's been on CNN with all kinds of comics in the past. Okay, um, it's fair to say though that Golden's best known for sport memorabilia. Yes. So sports cards and game use memorabilia and mm-hmm. other collectibles relating to sports. So we're number one in the world for that. Absolutely. No question. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are not number one in the world for comics, but I, I know we're in the, in the conversation now, which when we joined was not the yeah. case. You, well, know, if you said to a thousand people, you know, where would you sell or buy comics? Almost no one would have said golden. And I think now people will, I, mm-hmm. I think we've become known for it. Yeah, and it's not been easy, and I wouldn't say we're we're anywhere near going to knock Heritage off their perch, but we are in the conversation, which is all I wanted when I joined. I wanted to get us yeah. in the conversation. Well, I mean, you've had some pretty big books that come through, and I think every time you get one of those high profile books coming through, it it just it, it level you know it raises your stat as you know the status within the community, so. Well, there's that, but I I think that it's more relevant to just sell ev- average comic books. Yeah, you know, Golden Golden's always been known as a boutique destination. Mm-hmm. So, if you weren't familiar with our platform, you might just look at those big sales and go, "Well, Golden only sells high end stuff." 
Mm -hmm. And while that is important, it's it's critically important to to compete for those big collections. It's also important that an average person coming to the site can Not find something that they connect yeah. with and afford or think, oh, well, you know, maybe my Uncle Charlie would have wanted his collection to go to gold and not, not just, you know, they don't just sell Action Ones, we sell other things too. And mm -hmm. um, we, we're trying gradually to expand our horizons and, and start selling more and more different uh, verticals. We have a lot of pop culture stuff now. So we do Pokemon and, and Magic the Gathering, but also uh, music memorabilia. We have quite a, a selection of music memorabilia now. So drum mm. kits, guitars, um, cool. scores, uh, uh, concert posters. We've sold some of the, the most expensive concert posters uh, that have been offered. Uh, vinyl, mm. we sell um, VHS. So we are gradually expanding our horizons to offer a bunch of other stuff. And comic books can only benefit from that because all all boats are lift, right? And, and with a rising tide. Cool. So. Um... I, I want to quickly ask, when is season two coming out so we can see some comic stuff on uh, Netflix? Fantastic question. And, and um, the official company line on that is the next few weeks. Um, <laughs> which means nothing. <laughs> which which is a nicely vague way of saying uh, sometime in the spring. Okay. But we don't know. We don't even know when it, when it's coming out. And, because it's Netflix deciding, basically. That's right. The, the producers create the final cut, and then Netflix will decide when it's time to launch it. And did uh, you make an appearance in it, or did you get to be part of it? Or? I, I, I auditioned. Oh, okay. I was, I was told that it was too complicated because I live in Canada. Um, um, uh, they you probably have to do want a background everyone check. in the house, right? Well, you have to do a background check. Uh, which is extremely expensive to do a background check on a foreign national um, because you, you don't only have to do a background check on the U.S. Um, criminal system. You also have to go to the country. And I'm also from yeah. England originally, so they have to do oh, three man, background double. checks, <laughs> yeah. triple background check. Triple, yeah. um, plus, it was complicated because then, you know, if there's a collection they want me to be filmed looking at i'd have to be flown in specially it just it would got very expensive and all the expenses are borne by the producers of the show so what they basically said was we want to keep the original cast okay. um but i obviously i consulted on the comic book content so um it's a shame because i i think i think i'm a bit different to the to the cast that they have mm -hmm. you know we typically like a bunch of new jersey beefcakes in suits yeah it seems like and, that yeah and I, I'm just sort of dry and sarcastic, and and I think well, it you got been... the British British uh, sense to you, yeah. Yeah, British I wanted sense. to be the James Bond of comics, you know. I think that would have been a really <laughs> funny angle. Uh, yeah. There was a scene at the New York Comic Con. They were filming at New York Comic Con, and they got this big consignment, and they, and they all did a bunch of high fives. And I, if I'd been in the show, I'd have just been like, "There's no way I'm high fiving you guys. You must be joking. <laughs> British people don't high five." Um, <laughs> So I think it would have been fun, but I'm holding out hope that if season two is successful, they do a season three, I'm going to really just like sleep on Ken's doorstep until it lets me become part of it. Because I think I would have had a lot of fun with that. That's very cool. So um, this question I ask every person that comes on this channel, um, what big book, if you could, you know, what big book are you hunting for or would love to have in your collection? Detective 27. Mm -hmm. um, fine or better. Okay. <laughs> Ideally, with white pages. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big believer yeah. that white pages is the only way to collect. I think that right. the biggest enemy of comics is time. And mm -hmm. if you and that gives you a little more less, time. <laughs> uh, well, it gives you a lot more time. So I mm -hmm. think that the the chemistry of of paper is once it started the rotting process, it's mm -hmm. just going to accelerate over time. Whereas if you start with white pages. You know, I, I, I'm not expecting to be around long enough to see white page comic books disintegrate into dust. But I'm, I can imagine being around long enough to see brittle page comic books disintegrate into dust. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing worse to me than seeing Golden Age books with a brittle label. And you see pieces in, in, in the case as it's moved. It, they, they float around and they're like a sort of like yeah. a snow globe. Um, I, I bought a I bought a book once and I was like it said it said brittle pages I didn't see I didn't see that denote like you know and I'm like oh man <laughs> it's like all dust <laughs> it's like yeah I don't recommend it um, um I don't know the, the, see I'm still learning about foreign editions 
-hmm. So I don't know what the equivalent of a Detective 27 or a Batman 1 is in Lithuania or or, Mm -hmm. um, Saudi Arabia, but there must be those incredibly rare key issues that exist you know so so one of the things i'd love to be part of if someone is listening who sees this and goes oh that's a good idea a catalog of of the key issues of foreign countries that people yeah. could use and they go oh great finally i can see what i'm after you know at least i well, know what it looks like if i see it you know that's the thing i don't even know like sort um, of a gerber guide to like uh to the foreign editions would be really interesting without trying to be too completist uh, mm-hmm. Let's be frank. Most people don't collect every single issue in a run. They collect keys, and mm-hmm. and I I always felt like the Overstreet Price Guide should have been the Overstreet Key Price Guide, you know, because most people are looking for keys. So just carry mm-hmm. around a much thinner book that just covers all the keys, but in more detail. Yeah, and that that seems more relevant to me. Uh, but yes, a foreign a foreign catalog would be really awesome because it would put. Uh, those targets on people's radars at least and and probably flush a bunch of them out because people would suddenly realize oh that thing i've been, been yeah. carrying around since i was As a student somebody, was actually yeah. Worth something yeah yeah exactly so um actually you know it's interesting um i i collect warren magazines i'm not sure if you're mm-hmm. so yeah. familiar with but um i actually created a catalog myself <laughs> of all the foreign editions of the warren collection Wow. Okay, that's really cool. So, yeah, yeah. Like, um, uh, and I tried to get most of them. I actually have most of them. I'd say ninety percent of them. Um, but um, it's it, it's challenging because then you you you'll find like, oh, this really obscure country <laughs> all of a sudden had a had a printing of it that you never heard of. You know, and it's mm. you're, it's always like something you know always coming out of the the cracks kind of thing. It's just like all these um, foreign editions. So I think. It would be a real challenge to do the same with the comic version of that um because mm-hmm. they like i think they you know marvel was pretty um lenient about uh you know anyone that gives them money they basically say oh sure <laughs> you can go print it in your country um yeah like sure let's let's bring let's bring gwen stacy back and let you know yeah exactly you know. <laughs> so yeah so that kind of thing so uh, but um, yeah, um, that's that's really cool. So, um, so what, what's the what's the rarest uh, foreign edition of a uh, Warren magazine? Um, so one of the rare things is um, the Spanish uh, annual, uh, okay. the hardcover version of it. That's pretty rare uh, because it was already rare. Like the American edition of it had only two three hundred copies. And then the Spanish version is just like that that next lower level. So uh, yeah, I happen to ha- I have that in my collection, but it's super rare. There's probably only like twenty copies wow. in existence. Yeah, and so, maybe only ten people that care enough and, to, buy, uh... to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> well, any Vampirella collector would want it. It's like one of those things. Um, right. But uh, yeah, no, it's 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 interesting that way. Um, but any final words you want to say? Uh, before we I let you go like, sure i just want to thank you for having me on and and uh I, I would just encourage everybody watching to just at least come to golden.com and check us out and i'll put the link in browse. the description by the way i'll put the link in the yeah. description just, do you want just me have to a browse the, do you want Sorry? me to put the link do you want me to put the link to any instagram or anything else like so that they can reach out to you or Oh sure, you can put my Instagram on there. I think it's sell my comic books. So I'll, I'll give you that after this, and, and uh, yeah, that'd be great. That you mentioned, yeah, the the yeah, website and, sell and, my comics. And, yeah. yeah, and and just um, just get in touch if you need to contact me or Sean Goodrich. Uh, in, in the footer of uh, the Golden website is the expert page where we have all our experts, and we're on there. Um, and so uh, you can just email me directly from there, or call me, and I'll be happy to chat comic books with any anybody. Cool. Very nice. Um, so again, thanks for coming on. Um, it was a pleasure having you. And please, everyone that's watching, go to the check out the auctions. I mean, it doesn't hurt to check them out. So um, definitely, um, it was a pleasure having you on the show. So thank you very much. Everyone. And I'll talk to you again. Yep. Yeah, bye. Bye.